came into the parking lot and it was a torrential downpour. I had to take a boat to get from the parking lot in, but I made it, thank the Lord, because I believe in Noah's Ark and, okay, so. <laughs> So, Father, we just give you praise tonight. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be in your house and to be together. Father, we thank you for what you're going to do in the service. And Lord, what you're going to do in all the departments tonight, we give you praise. We thank you for the gift and the sacrifice of Jesus that we're celebrating this week. Uh, we thank you that we celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus every day. But, Father, we just thank you, Lord, that this week, Lord, we're just preparing our hearts for a, a celebration this Sunday. We love you and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus.
You know, you're my daughter, you, you know, you're my son, you know, I'm going to just, you know, my perfect will for your life, I'm just going to keep moving you in that right direction. Praise the Lord that he doesn't give up on us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And we can just come to him at any time in our lives for the things that we need and our shortcomings and his arms are always open wide. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. hurting and broken within, overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Joy from the ashes, a new life is born. 
caught up in the spirit there <laughs> Gosh. I don't know about you guys but we have a good worship department man when they play I get involved if you don't know how to get involved in worship 
We'll get you saved. All you have to do is come up here to the altar. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you, guys. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, are you glad you're here tonight? Good. I'm glad you're here, too. I wouldn't have nobody preach to if you weren't here. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, you may be seated. Praise God. I just want to say thank you so much. Those that are online, we welcome you into the service tonight. We're glad you're, you're focused in. And uh, we're going to have a good time in the Lord. Praise God. We're going to get into, into the Word of God. Hallelujah. Or should we get into something else? It's the Word of God, right? Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, before we uh, get into the Word, I just want to take a moment and say, thank you so much for your giving. You've been awesome. Even those online, I just want to say I thank you very much for your giving. You've been awesome. And uh, if it wasn't for your giving, we, we, we know that money answereth all things. But I, I like to say that money is the lifeblood of the flesh. And that's why I love it when Scripture tells us how to really dedicate the labor of our hands for the kingdom of God. And believe me, you are blessed when you hold aside a portion of whatever it is that you purpose in your heart to give. We're living in a busy world, and I thank God that God laid out clearly what a standard is to give. But you got to remember, what you have is sufficient. Everybody says, if you're not given a 10%, then you you got a curse on you. Well, I don't believe that. I believe that uh, we collect the finances for the church just like they collected the manna from the wilderness. There were elderly people that couldn't get out there and uh, gather their, their portion of bread. And the youngers went out and gathered more than what was necessary for them, brought it back, and they spread it out equally for everybody. And that's the way it works. Isn't that great? We all work together no matter what. And so I just want to take time to say thank you very much. We have a wonderful person at the wheel looking over your, your finances and, and for the Lord Jesus. I'm so thankful that I, that I have a good financial secretary, a woman of integrity, that she takes good care of the money for the Lord. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the people that are giving into our ministry. And, and uh, it's an expression of their love for you. Not just us, but the love for you and your word. And we'll do honor in their giving by making sure that, that they receive what is necessary in lieu of their giving. We thank you so much for Jesus and his ability to, to speak to your hearts and what you would give. But most of all, Father, I thank you that you've spoken in our heart how to steward their giving in honor of you. And so again, Father, thank you so much for those that participate with us financially. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, if you've got pencil and paper, you might want to get it out tonight. You might want to write some things down. Praise God. And uh, how many enjoyed my daughter? Lindsay, was she all right? She was okay. I, I, Mike Burkhart was here, I think it was last Wednesday night. I asked him what he thought of her. And he said, it's about time I heard somebody that knew the word. I wanted to slap him. But he was just kidding. But uh, he was really impressed about uh, the way she brought forth the word. I was too. But, uh, you know, we don't think that the leading of the Spirit 
depends a lot on developing the love within our heart. Because God, part of being led by the Spirit is the love of God growing in our heart. Praise God. Amen. Well, let's pray over the Word. Dear Heavenly Father, we're about ready to get into the Word, and we're just going to cover this subject for the next three, possibly four Wednesdays. And Father, I think that will be sufficient because of the content, the importance of this content. And, uh, and Father, I ask that you anoint all the ears that are connected to us tonight to really connect with what we say. I ask that you guide my mouth and my words in such a manner that they would get it. And uh, I just want to say thank you, Lord for revealing to me the things that I'm going to share. They've done so much for my life that I think now I've gotten to a place where I can share it. And so, Heavenly Father, help me deliver it the way that you have expressed it to me. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Ephesians chapter 2, the book of Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to get into probably one of the most the most critical how should I say it the most critical part of scripture that's very important for all of us mainly because of what it has done this understanding that I want to share with you for the next few Wednesdays this understanding has done more to help transform my life. And I so thank God for it. But in the process over the years that I've gotten into this area, it's done two things, Heavenly Father, that I am believing that it's going to work for them as well. I thank you so much for the understanding that you've given me in this area and for your people as well. Amen. Well, the area that I want to get into, I'm going to give it a title. And uh, uh, it's an interesting title, but it is an important one. The title for my teaching starting tonight will be called Reasoning a Verdict of Conscience. Reasoning a Verdict of Conscience. And so we'll start here in Ephesians chapter 2. And I want to read a few scriptures that, uh, that are important. Let's get a hold of this. In Ephesians chapter 2, let's look at verse 1. Ephesians 2, 1. And you, he has, he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit in that, my translation, my new King James, that should be a small s, not a big s, a small s. The power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. 
Now, this word for here for the, the mind is the word dianoia. It means this particular mind was involved in a process, what I term a thinking through. It wasn't just thoughts that came into motion, but actually they were thoughts that were captivated and thought through. And the mind here that he's referring to, of course, goes with the scripture. He's talking about the mind of the flesh. Now, he goes on to say, but God who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, and by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship. This really means we became a product of his ability as a craftsman. And he goes on to say, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Wow. Did you grasp a hold of what we just read? Did you people grasp a hold of that? You know, we were talking about one body, the one body of Christ in the earth, and it's made up of many members. If it wasn't for this insight, we wouldn't realize that when God did something for us to fit into the kingdom of God, he qualified every member. If you look at the one next to you, look at the one next to you. Say, I thank God he crafted you in such a way that we're connected together. <laughs> Is that good or what? <clears throat> but in some places I've been, it doesn't seem like nobody's ever read this. <laughs> Matter of fact, if you really read verse 1 through verse 3. I uh, had read this many years ago. I don't know if any of you remember the Holy Wars. How many of you, well, some of you were not even born yet, but we had a place called the Holy Wars. And they were catching each other and then spilling out all this uh, negative stuff that took place. And the first thing when I started hearing that, I'll never forget it, sitting on my couch with my wife. And uh, we were hearing one minister over another minister bringing out their darkness. And I sat and wept because these ministers were soul winners in the entire earth. They had value in what they were doing. And here, all of a sudden, these things come to surface that catch you off guard. And I remember reading this one day, and I was saying, Lord, what is it that we as believers don't really catch the revelation of what these verses really mean, that we once walked in them, but we don't no more? Where, where was the disconnect? Where was the disconnect? 
Well, without going into any detail, I think a lot of it stems with the fact that people really do not understand the purpose of the Holy Spirit coming into the hearts of men to do a work. And that's one of those three doctrines that I, I, I push, co-crucified, resurrected, and then that inward anointing that works in our heart. So the disconnect must have been there. But God has done his part for us to fit into the body of Christ in honor and in integrity, and we don't look back on the things that we used to do. So how is it that these things begin to surface? Well, over the years, I've spent my whole, most of my time in this area of dealing with the soul of mankind. I can truthfully say it really began back uh, when it really began to, to dawn on me about the soul and how it functions or operates, it was back when I was starting to go to Ramah. And uh, I don't know how many years ago was it, that's uh, 78, 79. Oh, I don't have my graduation ring on. It says it, but it was there on the ring. But it was, uh, I think, about 70, 79, and going to Ramah, <coughs> and... And that's when it began to, to really grab my attention on how the soul functions within mankind. And part of it was the fact that as I was going to Ramah, I also entered into uh, a school in another church that was teaching Greek. And so when I went into the, 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 the class, the Greek class, and began to study the Greek language through uh, the teacher and going to Rhema at the same time, uh, what I was re re receiving while I was in the Greek class versus what I was being taught in Rhema, that's what, when I began to take notice about the soul and uh, I decided to do uh, a, a research on soul, and uh, and so over the years, I, I've, uh, you know, John and them seen a lot of my notes on the soul and and everything, and and uh, I'm satisfied now with my understanding of the operation of the soul, and so I'm going to begin to do the best that I can to make this as simple as I can how important it is for us to understand the mind of the conscience. And when I say the mind of the conscience, I'm talking about the mind that we actually live in while we're here. And how the, the Word of God affects that conscious mind. Because if the conscious mind is not affected by the Word of God, then what happens eventually, eventually, we revert back and we reverse our course contrary to these verses. Do you got that? Now, how many of you got saved and you were perfect the moment you got saved? Any of you were perfect? I'm talking about perfect in your conscience towards your walk with God, even though you got saved. I'll tell you, I had a lot of zeal, but I, was, I had a lot of zeal dumber than a stump. I, I just didn't have any knowledge, but I had a lot of zeal and fire for God. Well, today, the Jew who rejects Christ have a lot of zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. And so... I became a prime suspect for grace. And it's mentioned right here in Ephesians chapter 2. Because what God has done for the believer, what God has done for the believer, is why God then could gift us with grace. 
because he knew that he left good seed in our midst called the, the Bible, good seed, because now we're good ground. We're his craftsmanship. We're ideal candidates for the seed of God's word to get in us and begin to harvest. Isn't that great news? But the problem is, when you don't understand the operation of the soul, you don't really know how to draw on the benefits of what it means to be born of the Spirit and then have to deal with the conscious mind, the mind of the flesh. So we're going to start, first of all, giving you a little insight about the word conscience. In the Greek, it's soon, soon, soon adesis. Is that the correct way of pronouncing it? It literally means a knowing with. It means a co-knowledge of oneself. The witness born to one's conduct by his conscience. The one born to his conduct by his conscience because a knowledge of one's own conscience means a knowledge of one's own actions as right or wrong in all conscience. And so when you look at conscience being the mind of the natural, the mind of the senses, it literally is referred to this way. The conscience is developed by natural birth before we receive Christ. It is the conscious mind before we're born of the Spirit that literally has been developed in us before Christ. It means we have received import, import or input from our surroundings, our temptations, the decisions, that which we take and act upon, what we know to be true, or I could sum it up this way, that which is governed our lives, that which governs our lives. I'm talking about a conscious that exists within man before he gets born again. And so that tells us right away in Ephesians chapter 2, it says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world. And I got news for you. If God had not done what he did to craft us into perfection for us to fit into what we call the body of Christ, people, we have hope. We have a good hope. Now by this faith, hope, and love. These three will live forever. And we have that. Thank God for those three. But the conscious mind is the mind of the senses. And it's affected in which we apprehend things by. So once you get born of the Spirit... What happens according to Scripture, and I'm just going to go through it real quick, like paraphrase it. What happens according to Scripture, the Scripture tells us very plainly that circumcision takes place within the, the heart of a person once they've received Christ and are born of the Spirit. And then the circumcision that he's speaking of, which he illustrated by circumcision of the Old Testament a cutting away of the flesh. And so the minute you were born of the Spirit, you were circumcised from the body of flesh. And the best way that I could tell you is the minute you got born again, you then begin to get a revelation, eventually a revelation 
that you have a different identity than the identity you were born into this world with. And I always have this illustration, the two minds. You have what you call the mind of the flesh, and you have the mind of the spirit. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because these two stay connected until you physically die. Or we get taken out of here, and guess who stays? The mind of the flesh. It goes to the grave. But within the mind of the flesh, we have what we call the spiritual mind. And the reason the spiritual mind is woke up is because he then has now an understanding of what I call identity as a spiritual being. He's now identifying with what he is spiritually. That's why John and I are working on a book, Born Again. Because if you begin to understand what it means to be born again, most of, most, of the, most of believers even think, well, what does that mean? Did I crawl back into my mother's womb? Just like Nicodemus. But thank God he left us scripture. He left us a seed that clearly defines what he has done with us in his craftsmanship to bring us to newness of life. Amen? Amen. But the problem is, we still have the natural conscience, the natural mind. And the Word of God has got to affect that natural mind, that natural conscience. And so really, spiritual development begins within us. It doesn't begin from without, it begins from within transformation begins to take place of that in the heart or in the spirit of man. That's where transformation really begins. But here's the thing that many of us don't realize because we stay connected with the, the conscious mind is that every time the spiritual mind receives insight, it automatically affects the conscious mind. And so if you don't understand this, then you'll even serve the kingdom of God through the natural mind. And that's a dangerous thing because what it have means that everything then that you accomplish in the Lord from the natural mind is what we call self-effort. I guess that's the best way to put it. Self-effort. Not realizing that if it took the conscious mind alone without the spiritual mind being activated in us, just the natural mind alone, then Jesus would not have had to come and make a place where we fit into the body of Christ in the earth. And that was not going to happen again because there was a change that took place. So, with that thought in mind, let's go to the next place to go to. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. Go back to Romans chapter 1. Let's look at some things. In Romans chapter 1, we're going to go way back. And we're going to go so far back, we're going to go back to the first fall. And the first fall was not Adam and Eve. The first fall was Lucifer. The word Lucifer means light bearer or light bringer. And we know that he was anointed cherub. We know he had a covering, according to Ezekiel. And we know that there was a planet here at one time functioning. And the same thing that took place in that planet is the same thing that took place in the world of Adam and Eve, and that was men occupied this planet. 
We don't know how old this planet really is, but we do know that something happened after the fall of Lucifer. It affected that entire, well, this entire planet, it affected it to where no one survived. No one. Matter of fact, the second fall, how many men did it get down to before it perished? Not eight, one. One man. That's pretty good, isn't it? For him to, to, to go that far until God had to put a stop to it. And he found one man that would do it. But he had prepared for that one man. But look at here in Romans chapter 1. Look at verse 21. Romans 1 verse 21. Uh, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish heart were darkened. Do you know what that's saying there, people? Do you know what it's saying? That after the fall of Adam and Eve, there was a process of time that took place over mankind that actually was going out of God. They were moving out of God. We are bringing them in to, back into the kingdom of God but they were going out of the kingdom of God, for they knew God. They knew who he was. Why? Well, they were the offspring of Adam and Eve. Now, we don't know how much time this took place, but we begin to realize that they were not even thankful. Nor did they even glorify God, but what happened is they began to cancel him out of their conscience. He began to cancel them out of their conscience because the word futile, futile literally means to cancel or to cancel out. And then the word thoughts, in their thoughts, this word for thoughts there again, again is to reason. To reason in thought and direction, to reason in thought and direction. And they are without apology, because that says well, we're without excuse. In other words, they were not even apologetic about it. But them knowing God... Although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. And what happened is their, their, uh, their th they became futile in their thoughts, their reasonings, in order to cancel God out. And they were doing this all with the conscious mind. And they... The Bible is not clear how much they really understood what they were spiritually. But I imagine if they were going out of God, there was some spiritual insight into their life. You know, I'm just saying. I do believe that they understood what they were spiritually in a physical body. And so God held them accountable for that because if they, he held them accountable for it, it's because they did know themselves as a spiritual being. And it said their foolish heart become darkened, meaning what happened is that something affected their heart. Now, <clears throat> when we're talking about um, the heart of a person, a lot of us don't realize that 
you're talking about a mind, in this case, the mind of the senses, and the mind of the spirit, because they were actually going out of God, so they were actually beginning to exchanging or reasoning out the thoughts that they had received of God spiritually for that which was natural. And that's what caused them then to take action in their life to that which was natural rather than that which was spiritual. Is this all making sense to you? A little bit of what I'm sharing, because I'm trying to share it as simple as I can, making a lot of, sta a lot of statements here. But if you notice verse 25, go down to verse 25. It says in verse 25, who <coughs> exchanged, look at this, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forevermore. Right there, it tells you that they had to have some kind of insight as to who God was because God is spirit. He is spirit. And so they had some, some connection with God to know God. Is this making sense to all of you? They had to have had some kind of connection spiritually with God. Or why would he then, if they pursued to believe what they wanted to believe and wanted to exchange the, their thinking about God towards the creation uh, or the, of God's creation, which was the natural man, natural woman, and exchange God for that, then we've got an issue that has finally developed to the point that it got so out of line, completely out of line, to the point God had to give them over to that mind. He had to give them over to that mind, that conscious mind, the mind of the senses. He just gave them over to it. What I'm sharing with you is pretty powerful thoughts. We have to think about these things. They're very serious. When I caught a hold of this stuff that I'm sharing with you, when I got it into my thinking and I meditated and I ate it and, and, and swallowed it, it had a direct effect on my conscience, my natural, sensual mind. Now, I don't know whether you guys realize it or not, but have you noticed that mankind right now, men and women that are of this world, that are not of the church, but they're of this world, have you noticed a change in their thinking? I have never before in my life turned the TV on and cannot no longer believe what I hear on that tube. Why? Because they're expressing a lie rather than coming from the direction of who God is. Thank God we do got ministers on the TV, you know, and they are preaching Jesus. They might not preach Jesus the way we preach him, but they're at least preaching Jesus. Amen. Praise God. So all of us haven't gone completely loony. <laughs> But the word imaginations here is really the word reasoning, reasoning. And it says in verse 20, for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Is that an issue that we have today? I commend those of you that are not aware of it because it shows me you don't listen to it. <laughs> but it's, it's out there. It's crazy. I mean, they're even attacking our children to let them be their own, their own 
uh, create creation, their own foundation of whether they're going to be a male or a female. I mean, I heard something on TV. I heard a lady on TV high up say, yes, men can get pregnant. I heard that with my own ears on the TV. They were questioning her and asking her any of these questions. She says, yes, yes. Define man with me. She said, I can't. They said, well, so you believe that a, that a man can have a baby? Women, how would you f- picture that in your thinking? <laughs> huh? You couldn't handle it. <laughs> well, but, but to think that you would let your conscious mind believe that trash. It is trash. That shows me clearly the natural conscience is going crazy. Well, this is what happened back here in Romans 1. The natural mind started going crazy. Even to the point it lost its ability to understand male from female. Now, can I ask you guys something? Is that screwed up or what? Oh, that was a Donald Trump move. (laughs) Shouldn't have done that. But it's messed up. It is messed up. Now, I'm going to cover this understanding of conscience. And uh, you might want to write some of these down. But we're going to cover... I've got some points here I want to bring out about the reasoning, a verdict of conscience. And uh, towards the end of this teaching, I'm going to get more into uh, the operation of what speaking in tongues does for us and, uh, and how it affects the conscious mind and the spiritual mind. First of all, we're going to cover the subject of a weak conscious, a weak conscience versus a strong conscience. We've got scriptures that cover that. The second one is that we're going to cover the witness of conscience. The witness of conscience. Now, these are bullets that are so important because each bullet that I'm giving you is what I actually had to go through scripture and get an, get an understanding of conscience. Does everybody got that? Okay, and so when I'm telling you this, what I'm saying is a weak conscience versus a strong conscience, we've got to identify what is a weak conscience, and we've got to identify what does a strong conscience, what they look like. And then the second one, the witness of the conscience, this is very very important because whenever we contact anyone, you contact each other even after this service, it's conscience to conscience that we're communicating, we're working with. So it has a witness. Our conscience projects a witness. And what does the Bible have to say about the projection of witness? Now, for an example, have you ever heard someone say this? You know what? He said he's a Christian. He says, but why is he doing what he's doing? You know why that is? Because the other one's conscience is giving the wrong testimony to what it should be given. We're going to learn a lot of good things the next few Wednesdays, and I hope we get it all in. Then we have what we call the testimony of conscience. The testimony of conscience. And then we have what we call the heart, the heart 
of a pure conscience. A pure conscience. Uh, and these are all in Scripture. I'll tell you what, our Bible is loaded with information. And the more information you get, the more you begin to realize you don't know what you thought you knew. Then we have, the Bible expresses, a defiled conscience. What does a defiled conscience look like? And then we have what we call a good conscience towards God. What does it mean to have a good conscience towards God? Then we have this one, the importance of understanding conscience. The importance of understanding conscience. I'm going to tell you people, when you get into that area, we're going to cover that area. That area, you are going to find that particular area entirely in the book of Hebrews. Paul covered it there. You want to know why? Because the Jew who was rejecting Christ, and why were they rejecting Christ? Because Judaism does not affect a conscience towards God. It does not affect the conscience towards God. What it does is it appeases your conscience rather than change it. Why do you think Judaism, well, those who adhere to Judaism, have not received Christ as a Redeemer? Why do you think they stick to Judaism versus receiving Jesus? They reject him. Why? <clears throat> because there's not a position that they get into in the craftsmanship of the witness of Jesus himself in order for the Lord to affect their conscience. But do you know the beautiful thing about it is? Our Lord is committed to the Jewish people. And he is going to turn back to the Jewish people and he's going to rescue them from the trash that's going on in this world towards them. I just want to make that clear so nobody goes out and says, he, he's even against the Jew. I'm not. Matter of fact, I respect the Jewish nation, but what breaks my heart is the same thing that broke Paul's heart. They rejected Jesus. Is anybody getting anything? Now, I want to cover something else before I quit. The soul is made up of two minds. You don't have two souls. You only have one soul. But contained within the one soul is the two minds. The mind of the flesh and the mind of the, uh, of the spirit. Again, they are, eternally, they are not eternally connected. They're, they're connected as long as you're, you're alive. But they're separated if you should die. Now, with that thought in mind, I want us to uh, go to, um, let's see, where would be the next place to go? Oh, yes. Let's go. Well, we won't turn there because of the shortness of my time. But in James chapter 2, James chapter 2, it says this. Uh, I'll give you the verse. James chapter 2, verse 26. It clearly states by James that the body without the spirit is dead. So that means that if you exit your body, 
Your spirit exits your body. Your body goes to the grave. Well, how do you know that? Because scripture clearly defines it. To be absent from the body is to be immediately present with the Lord. People call that soul sleeping. The reason they call it soul sleeping because the apostles and Jesus himself never used the term death. They use the term sleep. So they come up with this doctrine about soul sleeping. So you go to the grave and you sleep within the body and you sleep within the grave until he comes and resurrects us. Nothing can be further from the truth. To be absent from the body is to immediately be present with the Lord. Why? He already paid the price for you to come and be with him as soon as you exit that physical body. Now, what happens to the physical brain that goes with the soul? It goes to the grave. It decays with the grain, brain. Unless somebody got a vision that in heaven, everybody's still got their brain, but no body. And we know that ain't true. How do we know that ain't true? I'm sure glad you asked that. How about going to the rich man and Lazarus? Let's go to Luke 16, starting at verse 19, real quick like. Luke 16, 19. I actually had a study book, and they were covering this area, and they actually said, we don't know what body they were in when they were talking about it. So they looked at it as a parable. Okay, in Luke chapter 16, this is the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. That's what they call a parable who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. How was he carried by angels to Abraham's bosom? Was it his physical body that was carried by angels, or was it his spiritual body? It was a spiritual body. And it said it was carried by angels, and the rich man who died was buried, and being in torment in Hades, he lifted up his, did he have eyeballs? Well, was those eyeballs his physical eyeballs? And saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus' evil things. Now he, he is comforted. The word comforted here means that he is now in a place to be infused with strength. And you are tormented. And besides all this between us and you, there's a great gulf fix so that those who want to pass from here uh, to, to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. I beg you. Now listen. The spiritual mind houses itself within the natural mind. And what people don't really bring up, and, and, and uh, I'm going to bring it up here before I quit, that the mind of the, the conscious mind has within it a will, feelings, affections, thoughts, emotions. That's all in the spiritual mind. But those forces, those spiritual forces that is in the soul of the spirit or in the mind of the spirit 
channel themselves through the natural mind. They operate through the natural mind. So the minute you're born of the Spirit, the first thing that is affected is what? It affects the what? The conscious mind in this manner. It affects the thoughts. It affects the will. It affects the emotions. It affects all those things that come with the sensual mind. Why does it affect it? Because they exist within the mind of the spirit. How, how do you know that? Read Lazarus. It tells you they had feelings. They had emotions. He begged for mercy. He wanted wisdom to function on behalf of his loved ones that were still on planet Earth. So the mind of the spirit is really what houses our feelings, our emotions, our will, and all of those, literally, you have to wake up your spiritual mind to its identity that is on the inside of you so that it then begins to affect what you are in the natural mind or conscious mind. And that's why it says the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. It's talking about the natural conscious mind has no control over itself until that wrath which is in comes with the, the spiritual mind is then governing it properly. I know I said a lot here. Think about. But when we get into the faith message, we say, I'm not going to be moved by what I feel. I'm not going to be moved by what I think. I'm not going to be moved by my feelings. Well, people, I got news for you. In the, in the realm of your spiritual mind, feelings do exist. Thoughts exist. Amen? The thing is that when you're, conscious, when you're born of the Spirit of God, you're now transformed inwardly to outwardly. It literally means what has affected you inwardly will affect what you are outwardly, for it is working out through you, not from you to you. It's from you to you. Is that right to say it that way? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> So, have you, have you ever tried to fellowship with people that just drive you nuts? Have you ever done that? You just, it does affect your feelings for them. It does affect your thoughts towards them. <laughs> I, I guess I'm in that situation right now. But anyway, <laughs> my staff knows what I'm talking about. But you just want to grab them in the face and squeeze you know, <laughs> yeah, because doggone it, they, they, they just ain't got it together. Well, when you learn what it means to develop your thoughts, your emotions, your will, you're choosing the right things, going in the right direction, what happens is... Now something can begin to develop on the inside of you that will manifest on the outside, and it's called the fruit of the Spirit. But now, through this teaching, what's going to help us to understand something is that in order for the fruits of the Spirit to be developed within us, we have to begin to understand the warfare that takes place once we're born of the Spirit of God. And in verse 17 of Galatians, it says, the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit does not lust against the flesh. It doesn't say that. And the Spirit is against the flesh. And a lot of Christians do not understand that warfare. The warfare, we always look at Satan as our real problem. Boy, and if I learn how to deal with Satan, I'll get the advantage. Oh, really? <laughs> I've had delivered myself from an issue in my life knowing 
how to do it and everything. People, what's wrong with me? I Later on, just a little few steps down the road, I picked the sucker up again. None of you have ever done that. Just your pastor. <laughs> so you pick it up. The conscious mind is driven by something. It's either driven by the flesh or it's driven by the Spirit of God. And people say, well, what happens if you know what to do and you still sin? We won't cover that right now. Dealing with the conscious mind, <laughs> I don't want to get in that. It's not good. It's not good. <laughs> but anyway, the um, makeup of the mind of the spirit and the conscious mind is what develops the heart of a person. And literally, what you see with. This is where you see with the mind. And people don't realize that. But you know what you see with the mind is predicated on what has formed an issue of a heart within you. It's important to know that. And it's important for me to shut up. So anyway, we'll cover that a little bit, but we're going to get into looking at the weak conscience versus the strong conscience. We're going to go into the scriptures. We're going to look at the witness of the conscience, the testimony of the conscience, the heart of a pure conscience, a defiled conscience toward God, a good conscience toward God, the importance of understanding conscience and how to make it work for you. Now, we're going to close with this thought, and I want you to think about it. Do you know that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, I think it's verse 4, 5, 6, somewhere, it says, the restrainer will restrain till he be taken out of the way, then the Antichrist comes in. How many of you remember reading that? You know, and I have some people, well, I don't believe in our answer, and I don't believe in all this and that. Well, how many of you know in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus made a remarkable statement. He says, I'm going to build my church. And he said, the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it. Now, we're dealing with the conscious mind. You guys ready for this? Or should we save it for next? I got to say it now. Okay. I now understand why the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church and why it has to be taken out in order for Antichrist to come in. Because if you go over into Daniel, and I think it's chapter 10, 11, somewhere, he talks about the Antichrist being the God of reasoning. He says his God is the God of reasoning. He has no regard for his natural family. He has no regard for the sexes, of male or female. I mean, he, he is literally the epitome of the mind of Satan that will actually project itself in this earth. We'll go over there and read that next time, but I, I might as well just finish this. So, if that's the case then we have to be taken out of here because we do not possess the mind of Satan. We have been delivered from that and been given over to the mind of Christ. And the mind of Christ will never be subject to the mind of the devil. And that's why he cannot leave us here because God is the one orchestrating what we are doing to clean up our conscious mind. We're going to stop there. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that as we go through this particular subject of dealing with a conscious mind, that Father, it will have the same effect on those whom I preach it to. They will learn to deal with their conscience rather than becoming a captive of the hardening of their heart 
where their conscience is seared with a hot iron, becoming insensitive to the Spirit of God. We do not want that in anyone. So, Heavenly Father, I pray tonight, anyone listening by, by a live stream or even those here, I pray that, Father, they get before you and make a decision that the Word of God is the only thing that will change the way we think. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand up, everybody. If you're at home, stand up. Okay, go home. <laughs> Those of you online, you're at home already. You can be seated again. That's it.